Oh, Vandals. Welcome back, Mighty Vandals, to Tubs of the Club, the Idaho Vandals affiliate on the Big Sky Podcast Network. As not always, but sometimes, I'm your host, Dallas Hammer, joined today by Mr. Martin Heemster. Martin, how's it going? It's going good. It's Moscow weather can't decide what it wants to be right now, but it's nice to be back on and talk some more Vandal football. Dallas, what are you doing with your left arm right now? Uh, twitching. Uh, I'm just so excited. Like else. I'm realizing that uh, on camera, it probably doesn't look great, but uh, I'm actually just like uh, b- double bass pedaling my feet at the moment. Uh, anyways, uh, man, what a what a really raging start to this episode. Brian, are you here to put us back on the right track? Only thing I'm here for, man. Hey, Tom Kendall, Brian, Brian Doors, Open Marceau. Yes, hey. So, not important at all, guys. Uh, there is a dog with separation anxiety in my house right now. So, the door is open so that we don't get in, get interrupted by separation anxiety. You may see an Easter egg uh, on four legs walking in. It's part of the show. But otherwise, man, uh, doing good. Hey, spring football is coming up. It's kind of a weird episode. But uh, – we have tree talks in the comment section saying they keeping this on the rails and no, I don't believe in rails. I believe in as previously referenced tracks, but this is speaking of tracks rails. This is going to be a bit of a roller coaster episode. So I'm, I'm ready to buckle up and get going. Yeah. Speaking of tree talks, uh, first thing we've got to cover Brian with around the bar brought to us by Hughes River expedition is a little bit of sad news about the football team. Uh, Trevin Pixley of uh, the Lewiston Tribune slash Moscow Pullman Daily News slash, you know, all the other places that the article kind of gets pieced and picked around. Uh, UI fundraising event canceled as a result of scuffle allegedly involving football players. The West Treasure Valley chapter of the VSF voted 17 to 1 in favor of canceling the fourth annual Vandal Summerfest event that was going to be held on June 6th. Uh, estimated about $35,000 in donations. Uh, Marge Chipman, the chapter president, sent an email to the university uh, about an incident that happened on February 10th, uh, reporting 40 to 45 football players, some wearing ski masks and carrying broken PVC pipes was the direct cause of the cancellation. Uh, This was a large fight that happened on February 10th between multiple people. Uh, Brian, what we have heard is that the there was a football player that was kicked out of the party and then this became pause. a retaliatory attack pause no like that's the, the little confusion the, the you're right this this was a retaliatory the february 10th things was retaliatory but it is a, what started this wasn't on february 10th it was back on the weekend of february 2nd february 3rd um of what we've been told as a football player was forcible drug football players forcibly kicked out of the party. Hey, we know we don't have the football player end on this guys, but hey, this is the information we have to talk about. An mm-hmm. event on February second or third, uh, where a football player was removed from uh, from a party, and then it was the next week that the retaliation took place. We just want to bring this up. This was not like an organic thing where at a party, like hey, people, we've been to parties, people drink, drink it out of hand. That's not what happened here. This is a week after an event took place. Clear retaliation. Yeah. So the the, the email uh, claimed that one of the defensive linemen sucker punched uh, one of the kids at the door in the face, knocked him out, broke his nose, gave him a concussion. Uh, it just so happened that the victim's father was the biggest sponsor of this VSF event. Uh, and yeah, just not a not a great look here, Brian. There's one quote I want to get into at the end of this article, but I want to use that to transition out of this to talk about the next piece uh, of today's show. So your thoughts, Brian, and what do you know about this fundraising event being canceled? Well, again, like you referenced, hey, a potentially $35,000 type of event uh, that uh, the fundraising for the VSF uh, that's out the window. And I the thing I want to bring up here is look, the people quoted in the newspaper are they're pretty hardcore and old school vandals like this. This isn't sorry. This isn't like a terminally online Gen Z person getting touchy about it, which, Hey, forgive me for bringing up generations. That's how this stuff works. We have a multi-generational show, but this isn't like a younger person who is being touchy about something they happen to disagree about and, you know, terminally online make making a big deal. This isn't tubs at the club who relative to most vandals, we tend to be harsher on the admin than a, a lot of vandals are comfortable being. I think that's Mar- an understatement of the year, Brian, but continue. Yeah, but I'm bringing that up because, hey, Marge, Marge Shipman, um, she's the chapter president of the 
West Treasure Valley um, Vandal Scholarship Fund chapter. She is universally known as old school, hardcore Vandal. This is kind of person who, what I was told, like, hey, huge fan of Zach Kloss. And we went, we talked about Zach Kloss forever on the show, but I bring that up as in, these are the kind of people who are patient with the Vandal program. These are not people who canceled an event over a drop down in classification. They kept the event going. This is not people who canceled the event angry about Paul Petrino not being fired just because of his record. Record. They kept stuff going. This is not people who want to withhold money because of Zach Kloss doing what we know he did record wise. They kept the event going. These people are pretty damn serious as vandals. And if they're not only willing to have themselves named in a newspaper article and cancel the event, this is a big deal. Weezer is, is one of the types of towns in Idaho. And like these towns exist elsewhere. I lived in one in central Washington, Prosser where it's a smaller town and yeah, they love their university, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of pride of we, of what Weezer Idaho is for the people who have lived in Weezer a long time. And article brings this up directly a, a quote reference saying after this incident, none of us could see ourselves going out and asking for scholarships or selling tickets in light of this situation. Not when one of our own was brutally attacked. Bring this up again. This is this is people who have been vandals through thick and thin who are saying we're done. At least we're done for with this for right now. Um, so I bring it reason to bring that up. Anytime you see you see stories in the in the paper about a fight or something like that in the world we live in today, very easy for people to jump into camps and say, Hey, it happened. Hey, it, none of this happened, it's all fake, whatever. The people of Weezer are dead serious that, hey, obviously this happened because police reports, the injuries were real, but they're so damn serious about this. They canceled an event that there's a ton of pride in Weezer itself that they raise as much money relative to the town being the size it is. This is not minor whatsoever. And from what I've been told too, the athletic department, though they did put out a um, press release after the event, the athletic department has done none of the relationship building stuff you would expect should have should be taking place. Which is say every person I talked to about this, their immediate thought was, and hey, this is a colloquialism for a second, Dallas. That there's yeah, hey, gotta gotta go kiss some asses, gotta go mend some fences. No, the, the athletic department has to what we have been told, the athletic department has not done that. <laughs> so not only do we have potential legal issues, not only do we have the loss of money, we also have what feels like another department being a wall on a pretty damn big vandal stort. Yeah, Brian, it's just, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to see again, uh, just another time that the athletic department is just falling short. Uh, you know, I I've, I've been around a handful of different athletic directors uh, from my time in, in sports and man, this is just, this is one Oh one, like Bill Chaves, the old Eastern athletic director, that dude was great about like getting his face out there and and talking to everyone he could and trying to like you're trying to build like people to like you and like your school and like your programs because you want their money like you need to be very almost two faced in in, in being an athletic administrator you need to be so happy and so ass kissy at all times because you want people to keep the money keeps flowing the sports keep succeeding. That's that's how this works. And it's funny to bring that up as Eastern because uh, they've got their money issues. But Brian, to to see Terry Golick yet again just not do anything about an, something that clearly falls under her jurisdiction is frustrating. The end of this article says, uh, from again, a quote from Marge Shipman, we know there is an ongoing investigation, but if the volleyball in incident is any indication of how long it will take, we don't hold out much hope for speed and decisive action. These kids must be held accountable. They don't only represent themselves, but thousands of vandals who came before them, many of whom contribute their hard-earned money to provide for these student-athletes' education. To me, Brian, that says it all. Like, we, again, I, I think this podcast has been the, other than the actual OC register breaking the news, we're the ones that are covering the volleyball thing harder than anybody else. But like we're it's not just the tubs echo chamber that knows about volleyball at this point like you said die hard vandals are noticing hey something's wrong with this volleyball thing this is not this is not right 
and here we are again. Why why is Terry Golick not out in Weezer three times a week, shaking hands and kissing babies and doing the thing? Like it just doesn't make any sense to me, Brian. It feels like it's just yet another. Eh, we'll just drive over that speed bump and hope that we're going to be fine. Uh, and it's just a lack of respect for Vandals to me. Which it's clear that what Mars Chipman said about you with the quote you just read that clearly has to be why the that group voted se- if it was a 17 to 1 vote this wasn't any sort of split decision and hey here's the thing to be look whether you talk about a coach not administrator whatever no one's good at every aspect no one's great let's say at every aspect of the job and there's no one in the world who's reasonable who believes a person can be so look so in coaches Sometimes coaches are great with the X's and O's. Sometimes they're fantastic recruiters and motivators. And that's what, that's what really gets them over the hump. But no one's perfect, perfect at everything, but you, whatever you're not good at, you got to be great at something else to make up for it. Otherwise you don't justify your position. We've known forever. And anyone who's been around here for four seconds, Terry Golick's not a good people person. And I look, that's not a, that isn't meant as a put down. That's meant as a diagnostic statement. I have never met someone who said, man, I had a fantastic evening. I finally met Terry Golick. That's just not, that's not her personality. She has always come across as a person who, yeah, she looks like she's a little, a little aloof, whatever, but that she hangs her hat on being a technocrat, that she hangs her hat on what she believes to be competence, which is to say, that's the thing that Terry has to deliver because she doesn't deliver on the relationship part. She absolutely does not deliver on the, Hey, Vandals view themselves as a family and the people in Weezer. There are some of the people who do, who probably do view being a Vandal as being part of a family. They, they probably do view being from Weezer as this is more than just a town. So to connect with these people, she has to show action. She, and she has to show she's on top of her game with handling the with the issue itself that I guarantee if we had the, the people from Weezer on the show, they'd say, look, we get there's an investigation and that has to conclude on the police end. And look, we get forever. Look, this isn't the first time a football player has been in a fight. Now, re- retaliatory is completely different in nature. It is of a different kind. It is a it should be understand radically different. But it, look, a coach trying to handle as many disciplinary issues in house as possible, not news at all. But what you do there for people who are showing they're reasonable, which I think March Shipman's quote shows those are reasonable people. They're not asking for too much. You build the bridge. You show, like you said, you show up in Weezer, you spend time showing that you care and let them know, look, we're going to, some of this is going to be dealt with in house. Some of it's going to be legal, but there, believe me, there, the, there's going to be stuff happening. And I'm sure you'll know about some of it. Some of it X probably going to want to keep quiet. That That's his role. I, that's probably all they need is for the university to show, hey, we not only do, do we know this matters, but we know it matters to you, people of Weezer. We know it matters to you, March Chipman. So we're going to spend time on our, we're going to take our time and make sure we prove to you that this matters to us as well. By, like you said, showing up. Yeah, I, I want to... They don't do that. No, they don't. Uh, I want to hit which a couple you, things in the... Wait, sorry, one last thing, which means... If she's not going to be, if she's going to be terrible familiar with, if she's going to be terrible relationship wise, which she is, and then she's going to show, she's going to make everyone believe, Hey, the place action goes to got to die is Terry Golick's office. What's she bringing to the table? This is to me, her legacy now is in action for multiple for if, if the event, if the event seems to matter, it's in action. And you can guarantee when March Shipman and anyone else in Weezer is talking about timeline, they're not just saying, oh, like the OCRI investigation. They know it's been, the volleyball thing took multiple years. And that's how what their understanding now is, hey, we Idaho didn't even say anything about volleyball until it became national news. That's that's what it took for them to get action. Well, we can't make this national news. They're not going to do anything. Our only choice is to take money away. Yeah, I want to hit a couple things in the comment section real quick. Captain 58 TG has never cared about being liked. That's not a bad thing if the department is running right and the money's coming in, but this Weezer thing is proof positive that folks don't think it's working. I, I fully agree with that. Kevin Ridenauer, uh, maybe Ridenauer, Kevin, I never pronounced your last name right. I'm sorry. Uh, Vandal, giving day, Vandal giving day is winding, winding down. 
I wonder how badly Tichi's inaction affected fundraising. I haven't gone back to look to see uh, how today went against the previous years, but again, it's a certainly a valid question to ask because again, we see Weezer pulling $35,000 of donations just because the athletic director and the athletic department doesn't take this seriously until they absolutely have to. I do want to address a couple other things very quickly. Uh, Tom Kendall saying, so many fights happened in my time at UI, including football players. It was a different time in the 80s. Nate Mink responding, same Tom, but we're in a different age now. The one caveat here, guys, is I wouldn't, I mean, yeah, the PVC pipes is, is pretty, honestly, profanity alert for those who care. That's pretty fucked up. Uh, but it was, a you know, it, this was retaliation considerably after that you know if it happens at one party a fight breaks out like hey that happens retaliation up to a week later that's where there becomes a problem that's what i have the issue with captain 58 saying 40 dudes in masks with pipe fight with pipes tom fight sure but this is extra as the kids say and it doesn't look like tg handled it that's the whole problem i've got here is look this is obviously out of line if if these facts are correct that this is a this was a retaliatory thing and there's again let's say 20 ish guys and some of them have pipes. Yeah, that's pretty bad. But the fact that we're at this point and Weezer's pulling tens of thousands of dollars from the university because the athletic department hasn't cared, that's a huge, huge, huge problem, Brian. No, it, well, it makes it clear, like we talked about with volleyball, uh, Terry's got to go. The, Terry's got to go. If, if the, if the, um, if the game plan, for dealing with dealing with problems, dealing with stuff that blows up in public is silence, la lack of connection, completely looking like you're AWOL. Terry gets a, Terry has a six figure contract around two hundred thousand dollars of public money. It, the, she can't she can't show up to, to Weezer. No. And the, again, like it refer references in the article. They clearly the people of Weezer do not feel like the University of Idaho Athletic Administration is taking this seriously. How would they know? What would they know? Or what would let them know Idaho's taking it seriously? Like simple outreach. J just showing up, spending some time, letting them know stuff we can't talk about. And I'm sorry, if we can't talk about, we can't talk about it, but we're, we're here for vandals. And this is why on the show, this is why we prioritize Vandals supporting vandals. It's best when we can support the institution itself and vandals at the same time. Brain dead. That's that's how everyone wants this to work. But like, again, like hey, the people of Weezer, what they're what they're getting right now is nothing. They're yes. making it clear that they're making it clear they took that they reasonably took this personal and no, nothing. Come on, no, this is Terry's legacy uh, to me. I don't care what 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 bullshit press release gets rid after she hopefully retires when that contract expires on July 31st, 2024. Not that I'm counting. Uh, this, this, this is it. This, this is the legacy. This is not vandals. This is not vandals. Protecting vandals this is not vandals looking out for vandals. Uh, we are not close to the only people um, who have had the experience of, uh, Hey, Terry, Ter uh, Terry Gallic run entity is certainly not familial at all. And that is honestly how a smaller regional based university like Idaho is. That's how you get energy. That's how you get people to show up. You need people to feel like it is a, like this is a family and that once you're in, you're just in and Terry's not delivering there. So if she's not going to deliver on the other, other parts of the job uh, relating to the public. What the hell's her point? Exactly. Then what is she doing here? Uh, Man, just to sum it up as best as I can here with a couple comments from Tom Kendall. Weezer is a farming community and UI is the ag school. Not a good look. And one step forward, two steps back. Uh, that's what this whole, honestly, administration has felt like, Brian. Uh, and I, honestly, the Terry Gollick stink it, to me is, is starting to rub outside of the athletic department. It needs to go away right now. It, if she hadn't, hadn't hired Jason Eck, like, would there be a single person who would have anything anything possible like jason x been non-equivocal home run jason that kicks ass not trying to pretend that doesn't exist there's good stuff yeah. we're gonna get to later in the show like when we when i say legacy there's uh we got multiples in one area we got one happened to be a big thing but we got one big thing down it just needs to end what's the point Brian, uh, while we while we're we're talking about it, let's just rip the bandaid off. Last week, uh, you guys kind of brought me in uh, in my my study break, and 
I just dropped some bombs yelling about how frustrated I was with the volleyball situation. I never really gave you a chance to to give me your thoughts and feedback on Chris Gonzalez going on leave last week. I want I want to hear it from you as you're you're obviously getting some emotions out. Tell me what you think about the volleyball situation as it stands today. Well, first you got to update on the situation as, as it stands today, Dallas. Um, so we know, so we know that hey, last week we talked about it. Um, a provisional report was out is out, which players have had a chance to to read. Uh, players have also had a chance to have their own attorneys read. And the initial initial response to, from the report by Scott Reed uh, referenced about four areas that the provisional report found Chris Gonzalez to be at fault with. Um, the attorneys, uh, according to what I've been told, the uh, from uh, people very close to the situation, um, the attorneys uh, representing some of the University of Idaho volleyball players, their attorneys agree. Like the, the report at this point clearly finds Chris Gonzalez at fault for numerous things. So the timeline we have, we're approaching. So after the provisional report's done, there's about 10 players at, players and anyone named has 10 days to either rebuke what's in the report or to clarify what's what is attributed to them in the report. We are approaching that 10 day-ish mark. We're not yet there. After that 10, 10 days or so is done, uh, the final final report has to be written, which you probably assume that's going to be another week-ish or so. And then that report gets to Scott Green. However, there is a second report that is still around, probably around two weeks out from being done, which is the part focusing on climate and culture, which that's a bit more expansive. There's a lot more that that could potentially find uh, Chris Gonzalez at fault for, but it's that part is not done. So between the update on this, on the report targeting Chris Gonzalez and um, the finalized version of the climate and culture report, and then Scott Green having time to read through it, work with his attorneys, which you know that's that's there, and confirm next steps. This whole thing looks like it could be done in probably probably around the end of April is when we're looking at as a potential timeline. Keep in mind the spring football game is April twenty sixth. For those uh, hoping this would would have been done, I was one of those people hoping it'd be done. But the further update is with Chris Gonzalez on leave. Now, every el eligible athlete is showing up to practice. So it's, you're going from somewhere between four, varying times during the spring practice. Uh, there have been between four and six athletes showing up. We're now at around 10 or 11. So a much more normal group. It's not complete because of transfers. And there's some players who are injured who, who have to sit out. But the moment Gonzalez is suspended, athletes are back in. Uh, the fact of Chris Gonzalez not being suspended had was creating um, some uh, division might feels like it might be a strong term, but there was, there's certainly some, um, some ways where the players who are showing up don't and the players who are sitting out that in some ways don't necessarily feel eye to eye. Uh, please don't understand players showing up as support for Chris Gonzalez. The foreign players, many of them don't feel like they have an option because the, playing is why they're in the country but then there's also players who may have injuries or other concerns about being able to transfer who feel like they need to be in shape and good standing for whatever happens next as part of why some people be showing up but we're now now gonzalez is gone the whole team shows up so the response to that being is it, it's wild how the now the athletes hey they've what they've said in public and you know in, in private hey it looks like the 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 investigation is saying, yeah, uh, on a huge amount of what the, on the very least huge amount of the athletes reported, the investigation agrees. Uh, it was absolutely not okay and should never have happened by the way that would, uh, if Chris Gonzalez was found, you know, uh, to be at fault in 2023, you can, we haven't read the report yet. We still, still, need, still need a copy, but probably was at fault in 2022 as well. So there you go. Two, so the volleyball player has been right as we, we on the show knew for two years. Gonzalez is gone. Everyone shows up. This to me is the volleyball team being completely reasonable, showing themselves to be the adults in the room. And at the, then your, your question, the long answer now to your question of, Hey, Gonzalez on admin leave. How do you feel about damn time? Absolutely about damn time. This makes every, the fact of Gonzalez being pulled out now 
or the last week and the players showing up. It just reinforces that every single person who paid attention to this and who listened to the athletes has been right for two years and Gonzalez should have been gone the whole time. So look, we're, if you, if he's found at fault in the initial reporting, I think it's safe to say uh, this isn't breaking news, but if he's found at fault in all this shit, there's, there's no way his days are not numbered. So great news. Uh, but again, it's another example of AWOL admin of how was Gonzalez not put on admin leave? If you're, if you're in, Hey, I teach. And one of the, one of the uh, mindsets and one of the, you know, the, the North star of decisions is, uh, Hey, is what is our, is what we're talking about is what we're doing. Is it student centered as in, is it about making things better, making things right for the students you work with waiting this long to put Gonzalez on leave? Absolutely not student athlete centered. Not at all. Not at all. This was, uh, this was admin centered. This was avoiding personal litigation centered. This was a big F you to the players who've been reporting for a long time that, that they had to wait this long for something to happen. And it, to bring full circle this week, Dallas, Marge Chipman in the Intrevens article referenced it. If this is the action you get, the whole, what everyone's understanding is the health of Vandal, the health and safety of Vandal athletes, the health safety of Vandal students is does not it certainly is not looking like the guidepost of what the athletic administration is making decisions based on brian i mean just think about it this way we are almost 30 minutes into this episode a year ago two years ago this episode is entirely about spring football and we're in a great mood because we're talking about jason x you know first second now third season as the the vandal football coach and instead we're half an hour into this talking about all of the failures of the athletic department because the administration just continues to shoot themselves in the foot just like they're like they're trying to take their toes off one by one like it's like it's a game or something i i just don't understand again every single step here is just it, the wrong decision being made it it's almost applaudable actually to me at, at, at how just poorly handled everything has been throughout this tenure, Brian, I honestly, I mean, since you said it, you take out the hiring of Jason Eck, what really has Terry Golick done? That's, that's really brought a lot of good vibes here. Uh, she held on to Zach Claus too long. There's yeah, the beautiful new arena that you know, Rob Spear had a very large hand in getting built over the, the handful of years, but the attendance there isn't incredible because there's not a lot of great basketball to watch there. Uh, she fired John Newley at maybe the worst possible time and really hamstrung the next, the, the Amy regime. Like, again, I, I, I believe that the, the Amy's are going to get this turned around, but you, you fire Newley either three weeks before you did, or you fire him a year later. Like it, it just, there's so many different things that from every level, Brian, this is just a, a mess. And I'm, I'm just ready for this to be over. I'm ready to stop talk to keep talking. Sorry. I'm ready to stop talking about like all the bad things that are going on with the athletic department. This is just a constant at this point, and I'm I'm sick of it. We should be halfway into an episode talking about spring football, and hey, is this the year Idaho starts contending for national championships? Or like, or, like we should be in in an excited, like thrilled to be talking about spring football, and instead we're sitting here talking about the legal issues that are most likely going to come because the athletic director couldn't take care of one of her coaches. She hasn't cared to take care of a, an admittedly pretty rough situation with this football fight. It, it's just frustrating, right? And it's frustrating to be a Vandal fan and watch like, this is the state of this university right now. Yeah. But okay. You get a six figure contract for dealing with the rough things. You don't get a six figure contract for it because things are easy. The whole point of the compensation is because you are supposed to have advanced degrees, advanced knowledge of how to handle the things that matter. And last point for we, so we can shift and talk about spring football. I actually don't think the fight is that rough a thing for an admin, the administration. I, I really don't because I think the, this feels like the easiest answer in the world. This is being the, look, law enforcement was involved. We got to wait for law enforcement to finish their, finish their investigation. Jason, we know Jason. Look, we know Jason X series about discipline. Eli Cummins is just finally back on. He got kicked off the team, then had to redshirt for a year and be on good behavior. 
Like the, there are people doing their, there are people doing their jobs that, that you could easily lean on. But what you, the, the frustration for me, when I say this, this was, this is not a tough one. These people are reasonable and Weezer explain what you can't do and then spend time showing that you care. Easiest thing in the world. Every single person I have talked to about this, I said the exact same damn thing. Just show you give a damn and it's going to be fine. People will listen. But I guess that's too much to ask. I mean, that sums up the entire Terry Gallic regime to me, Brian. Just give a damn. That's all we've asked for years at this point is to just give a damn. We haven't gotten it. Any final thoughts before we move on to uh, again, the supreme tonal shift here. <laughs> no, um, I'm appreciative that we have a, a natural bridge to to move our tone up to. I mean, um, are you sure it's a bridge, Brian? Because I was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe a kayak. You know, maybe, maybe a canoe. Because if you're looking for a great all inclusive week long vacation, do not look past your backyard. Hughes River Expeditions has been vandal owned and operated since 1976, and they're ready to take you on the vacation of a lifetime. Enjoy a multi-day trip down the middle fork of the Salmon, the main Salmon River of No Return, the Salmon River Canyons, or even the Selway. You could even check out special trips like one to see the Persed Meteor Shower. Camp on pristine beaches, run amazing whitewater, hike scenic trails, spot wildlife, soak in the beautiful natural hot springs. And again, like I'm always saying, guys, Fish the most remote stretches of river in the entire United States. Just bring your clothes and HRE will handle the rest. Grab a paddle, catch dinner, and ride the bowl all throughout the Gem State. Call them now at 406-540-4450 or check them out at HughesRiver.com. Uh, I do want to address a comment in the, the section here from Jason Mayer. Just throwing this out there. If TG knows now she's leaving... The easy thing to do is nothing. I mean, I would I would have a slight pushback and say that nothing seems to have been her default for the last couple of years. But Jason does raise a good point. If she knows she's out, who gives a shit? Uh, she hasn't given much of a shit most of these last few years. So eh, just mail it in until July. Anyways, I mean, I, Brian, I, I look, I, I don't have, I don't have any pushback. I just, uh, Steve Kurtz in the comment section saying good segue and he's right. And I, I don't want to throw, throw away this gift that Colin gave us anyway. So look, yes. co co-signed, but ready for part two act. Two. Let, let's talk about the stuff that, you know, we, we want to talk about on this podcast. I don't like doing that first half hour. This is the stuff that keeps me around on tubs guys. It's time to talk. Vandal Spring Football. Producer Martin, you're hiding in the shadows, keeping the show running. I would like to have you out here for this. Thank you, sir. It's nice to see your bright, smiling face. You guys did a great job covering the quarterbacks and the defensive backs last episode. This episode, let's start things off with the heavies, the meat. Let's get into the defensive line. This is what we're all kind of expecting is going to be the strength of this team because, again, that, it was a pretty big strength last year, and most of those guys are back. Brian Martin, who wants to start? Give me something to go with the defensive line. So I guess the first thing I want to say is the D-line, complete opposite of what we talked about in the secondary with, with Trevin Pixley last week, which is if there's one – pretty known quantity on this team or one position group that we can feel like we were pretty damn set with it's the D line um, phase one. There were some good producers last year and mercifully, at least thus far, the D line has not been picked apart by the transfer portal, which uh, full disclosure was a complete surprise to me. And the fact that it hasn't happened, I think is, you know, Hey, credit to the athletes who are bought in on being here, credit to the coaching staff for creating a place where, you know, guys like Dallas Afalava probably had chances to go somewhere else. And at this point they have not yet. So both the players and coaches who created the atmosphere that brings back of the, look of the 21 roster D linemen, 17 are returners and the four new guys are freshmen. So, Hey, no transfers. It's a ton of familiar faces who are coming back and look, some of, some of those, those key names, 
we got Keyshawn James newbie who will be a redshirt junior 38 tackles, five sacks, led the team in sacks. Uh, Dallas off lava as a reference, 26 tackles, five sacks last season and off lava as the year progressed, really, really started to deliver and got better and better and better. Fact that we have him as young as we have him back is a, it's a God damn it. It's just such a huge deal to me. And um, look, Hey, we'll talk about some of the other, some of the other players. Just want to reference those two big names, but Martin, look, you've been at practice. So I guess we're talking D line. You've, you've seen some scrimmage, not a full pad scrimmage. Yeah. You've, you've seen some play. Um, this was a, str- look, this was a strong group last year. Uh, not necessarily like getting to the quarterback, but look, overall conference stats, Idaho's rush defense was number three in the conference. You're talking about uh, yards per game. Uh, they were, you know, they were to- in the, certainly in the top half, sorry, yards per rush there towards the top. So this, this unit did produce for sure. And so much experience is coming back. What have you seen that experience deliver in the in what you've seen? It if and when we do talk about our defense of the line, you're going to hear me mention this a uh, D word a lot called depth. They they have depth this year. It seems like there's not going to be a huge drop off from like the first string to second string, like you might have seen with other positions last year. Uh, the name to kind of watch out for, um, I, I the name to watch out for. On odd defense this year is a is the one of the freshmen that came in early, Titus Springer. He's already getting rotations in with the second string defense. Patty, if you're listening, you want to correct me on that, but that's what I'm pretty sure we've all that's what I saw at practice on last Saturday. Like Jakari Larman isn't even a like he was getting reps with the twos last week. Granted, that may be because he's more run specialist, but he's it, there's a lot, just a lot more depth to this team on defensive line this year, this time around. Yeah, speak of the depth. So uh, the the key departures for anybody uh, that isn't super familiar with the roster so far, uh, Tylen Coleman and Ben Bertram graduated out of the program. Uh, Tylen Coleman, 27 tackles and four sacks last year. Uh, ben Bertram uh, ended up not playing a ton, but uh, had 19 tackles and a uh, sack and a half. And then again, you've got Jakari Larman is still around. Amari Notice is still around. Sam Brown and Zach Crotzer have both had a bunch of time. Uh, I mean, honestly, when we're putting together this, uh, we put together the key returners. Guys, there's there's seven names we put on the key returners list for for the defensive line. There's only four positions that 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 line up there. Like this is to me, this is the depth of this program. And again, we, we know that defensive coaching staff has really shuffled around, but. If Idaho is going to have to go on the same kind of run that they did last year, where there's multiple playoff games, multiple possible wins on the table in the playoffs, this is the squad that's got to be the ones getting it done. I would expect to see Keyshawn James Newby and Dallas Afalava probably both improve on their sack numbers, uh, or at least maybe their pressure rate. Maybe it doesn't end up in, in full sacks. Maybe you see a little bit more of that from the, the rest of the guys that were only able to get a half sack or one sack this year. But uh, to me, this is this has to be the strength of the defense. Uh, we know that the secondary is being rebuilt, as you guys talked about last last week, with a bunch of new seniors in. Andrew Marshall's coming back uh, and has, has looked very good. There's some other uh, young guys in that secondary, but the way to help those guys out is for this defensive line to get after the quarterback. And again, there's so much depth here. It feels like this is this is one of those that you can just rotate guys in and out, and you're going to get that same level of production throughout throughout the game. And that's. That's going to be huge, especially towards the end of the season when we've seen it for years now. The Vandals' lines just get beat up and bruised and taken apart by the end of the year. Which I want to touch on the secondary for one second. I've been told that transfers Corey Thomas Jr. and KJ Trujillo are both pretty clearly the number one and two corners in practice so far and that transfer Abraham Williams has been playing with the twos, which is say, Hey, um, worth, worth it for you guys to know. Um, when I talked to Dan Jackson during the, uh, during a basketball game this year, he was pretty damn high on the transfers. Well, Hey, they're already jumping to, to the top of the depth chart. Only bring that up Dallas, because look, the, the, the secondary is where the un- unknown quantities are. It's good. It's good to hear who's emerging already, but, um, Honestly, to me, the the unknown quantities on the D line, it's all it's all great news. Like Jakari Larmond was pretty much an every down player uh, for the majority of 2023. And Martin, you're talking, which you reference is, hey, with his size, he he you know he stereotypes as a little bit more of a run stopper. The fact that Sam Brown, who 
hey, Sam Brown was on the team last year. He absolutely play, played a ton of meaningful snaps, 11 tackles, half a sack from Spokane, Washington. Sam Brown has been re- taking some of Jakari's old reps with the ones. The fact that the improvement has been significant enough from a guy with the program, Sam Brown, for a while, to replace a guy who is a very strong producer in Larmond without look, look Larman's not hurt or anything. Sam Brown's just getting better. Uh, this is getting me pretty damn ecstatic. Um, and the reason I bring it up is you guys talked about depth. Um, and we look, we've known, and Hey, X says this in interviews all the time. And the X says this in interviews cause he's correct. If you look at the most recent teams who are competing for FCS championships, their relative strengths are O line and D line. Obviously, if you're if you're at that level, there's other things you do well, but it's pretty damn persistent. The teams that are advancing in the playoffs have the size up front on both sides of the ball. And in year three, X sure has shit so far. It looks like he's delivered on bringing athleticism and now depth to the D line. It's a huge, huge developmental step he, and just m- more evidence of things working well on the defensive side of the ball. It's actually kind of wild to say. With the with hey the asterisk, we all know because we, we did this before. If there's an experienced group returning in spring ball, especially on the defensive side of the ball, that side is probably going to stand out in spring ball. And we just know that doesn't mean hey, if there's some new dudes on the on the offense, expect they're going to look like they're a step behind in spring ball and just don't lose your shit. That's how this works. Uh, my understanding is, and hey, uh, Trevin had a write up in the paper as well. Seriously, guys, you should be following uh, Trevin Pixley on Twitter for sure and read his stuff at Lucent and Tribune. But in the um, initial scrimmage, initial scrimmages or initial, pra- you know, uh, sorry, initial scrimmages, not full pads yet, the defense is what's standing out. Well, hey, that tracks last season, Idaho overall. You probably, I believe the defense was the relative strength. And with how much we have returning on the D line, internal improvement seems like a reasonable thing to say, Hey, this is how this defense takes the next steps. All the, the contributors stayed. They were all young underclassmen last year. As guys get older and mature, they get better. It's actually, honestly, it feels old school Dallas coming off of basketball season. Where we already got a thousand dudes in the portal that on the football team. No, like guys have stayed and gotten better. It's um, I don't know what else to say other than I'm, I'm ecstatic to find, to hear that the, the guys who, who come back are showing natural improvement, natural improvement enough that it's actually reshuffling a little bit of what lineups we see with the ones. Well, I, I do want to quickly hit on uh, Titus Ringor. Martin, you mentioned uh, Titus Ringor listed at 6'3", 276 pounds as, again, a, as a big boy. As a freshman, that is, that is truly impressive. Brian, you talked about, you know, you got to have that size on the line to, to, to be a dominant program, uh, at least in the FCS right now. And I'm just, I'm scrolling through here, looking at the defensive line and, and he's already one of the bigger guys on the squad. Martin, very excited to hear, uh, hear how he progresses in the spring. Do you have anybody else on the defensive line that, uh, that you wanted to give a shout out to that you've seen so far? Not a lot. The one I'm I, not a lot. Like I'm kind of also excited to see like Crotzer play a little more. He kind of showed up a little bit more towards the end of the season. Another one from my camera, the school in Spokane, but uh, Shadle Park. Shadle Park. I'm excited to see him. Like I know K- KJN didn't play in the in the set in the Friday practice I went to last week, but I'm kind of excited to see him develop, continue to develop as well. Kind of play the bookends with like him and Malachi on each end is going to be I hope something to kind of terrorize the Big Sky quarterbacks for this next season. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, if you're new, KJN is short for Keyshawn James Newby. Uh, one of the edge rushers, but uh, Martin, thanks for bringing that up. Um, Zach Crotzer is another dude who I feel like emerged last year, especially towards the set towards the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah. Yeah. Hey, local guy. I always like to see local guys produce, but the fact that we saw him look pretty damn good towards the close of the season. And he's part of depth on this team. That's fan. Fantastic. And one of the, one of the potential things Dan Jackson is going to have on his disposal at his disposal is the ability to rotate a lot of ones and twos, keep guys fresh, not diminish chance of injuries, and not feel like you're taking a, a step back, which hey, that was one of the things we did talk about on the show uh, many times in years one and two, which is depth wasn't there because how could it be after year one and two? Well, we're starting to see the fruits of the recruitment, the development of, the, of this team. We're starting to see that in, in spring ball. And the D-line, 
I, I front and center. If you want, if you want to look at Vandal football and say, Hey, what is an example of something that is clearly going well, which hey, there's the finish in the final eight last year. There's a lot going well. D line top of that list. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big thing for me is the, again, with the transfer portal, it's not like you're going to see guys like Dallas off lava here for four years. I'd love to see him here for four years. I'm, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, and I, I highly wouldn't, I would not recommend holding your breath on that. Uh, even a guy like again, KJN, uh, there's every chance that he could be gone next year and take his senior year with an FBS squad and, and try to go to the NFL like that. Like guys have that right now. They're welcome to do that. But you look at this defensive line, there's one senior on the roster. Jakari Larman is the only senior at the moment on the entire defensive line of, Again, 21 guys, I think, uh, maybe you know, 17 or 18 that are in spring practice and then uh, a handful of more guys that will come in the fall. But you look at just the, the way that the, the roster is constructed. Yes, there's a bunch of, again, KJN's a junior. Amari Notice is a junior. Sam Brown's a junior. Zach Crotzer's a junior. Malachi Williams is a junior. Like you got a bunch of guys that are towards the end of their careers. But you just you look at the depth, and it's, it's just freshmen and sophomores everywhere, guys. This is... This is what we talked about when X very first spring practice happened was, hey, there, there's there's talent on the roster, but there's going to end up being a purge here. He's going to bring his guys in. What's that going to look like? Oh, I think you're seeing it again when we're talking about a true freshman coming in at 6'3", 276 in the spring, uh, right now, you know, not even his freshman, uh, excuse me, his fall semester for his first year he's here in the spring and he weighs six three two seven he's six i mean that, that, that's insane that's just that size that's beef as i as jason mayer says idaho beef this is this is what we were all envisioning two years ago when we were talking about man it, it, can jason eck turn idaho into the bully that we we were hoping to see when they drop down to the big sky this is what we're talking about this defensive line is huge and there's so much youth here who knows? There are guys that are that. I mean, were we talking about Dallas Offalava last year as maybe being the best player on the defense? Fun fact: uh, Idaho player is saying Keegan Henson is saying he's three hundred right now. There we go. That is truly insane. Thank you, Keegan. Inside information there. But guys, we weren't talking about Dallas Offalava a year ago being like the linchpin of the defensive line. There's so much youth here that there will be guys that are going to show up in the fall that we 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 just don't know right now. It's just it's a very exciting time for Vandal football because again, we we've seen where they're going and, and it's pretty safe to assume that we know where they're headed to. Any final thoughts on the defensive line, gentlemen? Uh, Not really. I mean, it's look, Hey, all of these position groups, we're going to continue to watch and track their progress. But the theme I talked about last week with Trevin is for the most part being relaxed about spring ball, knowing that we've got a lot of guys who are known quantities and some of the new, some of the newer guys we feel pretty damn good about. Uh, Matthew Frazee (laughs) says Frisco, please say, please be Frisco. Uh, God damn it. I'd, I would love to be able to go to Frisco so damn much. But anyway, um, I just love that. I, I mean, look, hey, like a reference, you referenced earlier, total shift for sure in the show. It's so damn nice to be able to be at spring football and just think about, and like the most reaction is about a ton of dudes are, the team looks great. A lot of, a lot of stuff in the team looks great. And a lot of the areas that are question marks were, we're not that worried about like, hey, we'll talk about O-line. I think we should probably you pick that up on the yeah, you think we should probably talk about O line on a different show? Th- exactly. Yeah, with with just the timing that it works out, I think I, I'd rather us focus on offensive line on the next show rather than try to cram it in here at the end and not give it the love it deserves. Yeah, but um, I don't know. It's a, it's such a weird. It is such a weird place to me um, to be a vandal and that like when we're talking the sport, uh, like we. I like, I completely understand people now, like always wishing it was, it was September for getting ready for football season to start. Ab- absolutely. So yeah, Tom Kendall saying, Oh, O line deserves its own show. Um, agreed. That's, a, that's also a younger group. And I don't mind having a larger sample size of practice to get observations from, mm-hmm. uh, because in the same way, Hey, we said the D line, 
ton of guys returning. Well, like there's a, there are a ton of O-line guys returning, but the, there's, there's a difference in, in age of, of contributors and that, that matters. But um, I guess, I think before we, we close at Dallas, there's a, so a couple basketball things we could hit on for a second, but before uh, I shift that Martin, anything you want to add to close out talking D line? No, I'm excited for everything. I, I, I'm excited for next week's show already because I that's like the one thing I decided to focus on next week. Focus on is offensive line. I know Patty's talked about it a lot in the Discord hashtag patreon.com backslash tubs at the club. It's you're gonna hear a lot of offensive line talk and it's deservedly so. Like you're seeing a lot of stuff. Hi, doggy. Thank you, Martin. Wow, I just I, I I was so enthralled with the dog in the background uh, sneezing that I I I had nowhere to take that. Uh, Brian, you're our resident basketball expert. I know that you're uh, you're distracted by your dog, so I'm just filibustering randomly here. Hashtag Bo Baldwin, Eastern Washington. There we go, uh, Bo Baldwin, new Eastern Washington basketball coach. Before he takes over the football program next year. Uh, Brian, you have some basketball news for us. Well, it's the Big Sky. There's two level. There's some Idaho news, and then there's some Big Sky news. Um, the Idaho news is Colton Mitchell uh, transferred to University of Idaho from Idaho State. He averaged about eight points a game at Idaho State, but uh, his tape, he looks like he's a pretty dynamic guard. You would completely understand had that dude been in Moscow last year, I, I expect he would have started. Uh, and when you're in Idaho State, if you're a guard, keep in mind that system Ryan Looney runs is not card friendly. So any stats you're looking at for a guard add a few points and that's probably what it would have been in Moscow. So that projects off my like moron math as a, over 10 points a game uh, as a freshman, which we would have been ecstatic about. So um, stoked to have Colton Mitchell. He can shoot. He's, he's a ball handler. So those couple things Idaho was missing this last year. Um, once the team's together, of course, but we're going to know what that matters. Where everyone's always, we're always excited when new recruits come in and then, hey, they materialize or they don't. There's a lot of reason to believe Colton Mitchell is going to be a, a good, uh, meaningful addition to University of Idaho basketball. We'll see once we actually get to the season. There's two, at least two, there's to our knowledge, two more scholarship spots left on the roster. Uh, like Tom Kendall said, CDA guy too. Yep, graduated from Lake City High School. Um, my older brother graduated from Lake City High School. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, a lo- if a local guy can contribute, kicks ass to have that to have that dynamic on the team. Um, the bigger news and something that Dallas, I think, there's probably more you're interested in going over, is uh, yeah, David Riley, Eastern Washington head coach, uh, just announced today as the, or yesterday. Um, David Riley is taking over as head coach of Washington State. Riley spent three years at Eastern, uh, built the program back up from the ashes after Shante Leggins left with all of the program that wasn't the Groves brothers who went to Oklahoma that year. So he started from the ground up uh, first guy to get Eastern back to back 20 win seasons ever. So pretty damn good. Of course, the story uh, in the big sky, it always circles back to, he did lose back to back in a uh, second round of the tournament, but Eastern's first game of the tournament back to back years. Um, I, I don't know. I, I th- he's, he's coached for three years. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't obsess too much about that at this point. No, I, I wouldn't either. Um, again, first his first head coaching job after he's been at Eastern for what, like a decade plus at this point. Um, Wait, I work. wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be too worried about it. What I do find most interesting about it, Brian, is that they actually went to a different coach in the Big Sky first, and he supposedly turned them down. Uh, Matt, he didn't Wilson, supposedly turn them down. He did. But there we go. Uh, again, where I haven't heard anything specific or we haven't seen him explicitly say, you know, he said the uh, family and finish what we started. You know, I didn't want to put words in his mouth, but Matt Logie, the Montana State head coach, who uh, I notoriously uh, clamored for a couple different times during the Zach Kloss era, thinking, hey, well, why this guy was a great head coach in D3. He's a great head coach in D2. Why, why don't we give him a shot? Uh, ended up. That was who Wazoo targeted initially, and then he, again, he chose to take a long-term contact, contract extension and raise with Montana State. Just a an interesting have, situation with, with Washington State, Brian. I have some slightly inside info on that. Um, I was told by a reliable source um, who would have learned this from, more from the Montana State end that apparently David Riley bombed the interview 
which is and Matt Logie then did not bomb the interview, which is why um, Matt Logie, who objectively has a worse resume as a D1 coach, mm-hmm. um, he has a great resume coaching elsewhere. He's, he's a different kind of candidate than David Riley. Riley's coached in one place. Logie's coached multiple places. But uh, last year, Montana State went 17 and 18, and he was the guy WSU initially went for. Apparently, Riley bombed the interview. And then when it didn't work out with a couple of other candidates, including uh, South Dakota State's head coach, that's when WSU went went to Riley. But um, the Idaho end of that, of course, is hey, uh, David Riley ha- is from the same coaching tree as Alex Pribble, uh, the Jim Hayford coaching tree, which has served Eastern Washington quite well and has now been exhausted, to my knowledge. So question for Eastern is, hey, what direction are they going to go? But I bring that up from Idaho is, hey, look, if team for Idaho to move up, someone's got to fall and Idaho's got to rise. Eastern just became a candidate to potentially fall uh, mm-hmm. while Idaho has stability. And you got to gotta expect there's going to be, there's probably going to be some players leaving Eastern too. So that program, I wouldn't be shocked if that's on factory reset, which means, hey, there's another program. Idaho, so suddenly Idaho might not be looking up to Eastern. Now Eastern has reliably replaced their head coaches for a while, ever since Jim Hayford and done fine, but that tree's gone. So wherever they go to next is going to be a different version of starting over. Yeah. Uh, I, I got, I got nothing else to really add to that, Brian. Uh, like we can hope and pray that Eastern is going to fall behind Idaho in the pecking order. But again, we, we need to see a, a pretty sizable jump uh, out of year two of the Pribble era. Uh, Matthew Freeze in the comment section, Verlin getting canned turned out to be a watershed moment in Vandal basketball history. I think that's why so many of us look forward to football coming back. I think this phenomenon predates Eck. Oh, it definitely does, Matthew. It definitely does. That last year of Verlin was was real rough and then again four four solid years of Zach Kloss where we got close to 40 wins over that time it's been a long time coming to get out of that big sky cellar Brian six years of losing basketball and seven years without a big sky conference tournament win Vandals with only two big sky conference tournament wins since returning to the big sky on the men's side in 2014 2015 Matthew so yeah uh let's just say I'm co-signing the entirety of your comment and with that said, man. Uh, with Dallas, that said, can Zach Kloss get back into the big sky? That's the Martin story, man. Martin is the one who invented the Western Colorado <laughs> Mountaineer Minute. Martin sits in the background, like not saying stuff for the most part. But hey, if you're a listener and you're thinking, why in God's name can these guys not stop? They cannot just let go of Zach Kloss. I let go of him a while back. There's someone who's involved in the structural production, maybe the producer of the show who just won't let that go away. So Martin, Hey, this, this is your story. Anything you want to add on the impending Eastern Washington men's basketball coaching search? No, I just hope they go on the left track and everything falls off the rails for them. Go Vandals. (laughs) I think that's perfect to end it here, guys, as always go Vandals. Go Vandals. Go Vandals.